What do you think? Good to go? I think we're good. Okay. Uh, hey, everybody. Um, thanks for joining us today. I'm Ellen Burge. I'm here with my partner, Shaheen Rothermel. We are looking forward to giving you an update on automatic renewal laws, um, federal and state. Um, this is something we've been doing at least annually, maybe even a little bit more frequently. Um, something we're certainly writing about as much as we can. Um, and just trying to keep you all updated because this uh, zone of uh, practice and marketing is constantly evolving. We've got some new state developments to talk about um, this time around, new cases to go through, um, and hopefully answer some, some new questions along the way for you. So um, today we're just gonna give an overview of what's going on, uh, show you some cases. Um, we're here for some questions. We've got a lot of content, so if we don't get to everybody's questions, we will follow up with you later. I think you can ask questions through the chat, which we'll, we'll see if we can check it, but otherwise, why don't we just get going? Um, okay. Okay. Okay, so um, let's start um, where it makes sense to us is just to start with federal law, of course. We are still um, looking at the Restore Online Shoppers Confidence Act, ROSCA. This is the law um, that is uh, afford, enforced by the FTC and it applies to um, online uh, subscription sales and enrollments. Um, three basic prongs of ROSCA, um, providing clear and conspicuous disclosures about the material terms and conditions of the offer, obtaining the consumer's express informed consent before charging them. Um, um, and really the language there is before obtaining their account information um, and then providing a simple mechanism to cancel. So three basic prongs. Um, the FTC does not have a rulemaking authority to elaborate on these, but as you'll see um, what they have done through cases and settlements is sort of speak uh, more and more detailed terms about what they think is required to meet these prongs um, in this day and age. Um, FTC, of course, also has the telemarketing sales rule. So to the extent an enrollment in a subscription program or an automatic renewal program is done online, the TSR has its own set of requirements, again, based around disclosures, consent, cancellation, those types of things. But um, the TSR has its own set of rules there. And then um, for everything else, in including those online and phone and anything else, um, we always have Section 5 of the Federal Trade Commission Act, which just simply prohibits unfair and deceptive sales practices. So that is the universe of, of the laws that we're looking at there. Um, moving to the state laws then, um, the state laws are going much more detailed than the federal law. Um, they always have been. Uh, for many years, we've focused a lot on California law, um, other states came along and um, updated their laws to look a lot like California law. Um, and then some states came through and, and brought some sort of newer variations into play. Um, as we're gonna talk a little bit more about later, California is now um, has some new updates to its law that are gonna push it a little bit further ahead even than some of the, the existing standards um, on things like um, cancellations and, and other such things that we'll get to. but. Um, you know, the states are getting much more detailed and um, the, in the state laws, they will specify exactly what you need to disclose, like what are, um, you know, material terms, um, which we'll get into. Um, they specify a standard for what makes something clear and conspicuous. Um, so as you would imagine, it's, you know, that standard really means it's unavoidably noticeable, but we'll talk about that in some detail. Um, sending order confirmations out after somebody has enrolled in a program, really important. And now what goes in those order confirmations um, is um, extremely critical because we're seeing some of the cases um, focused on what is or is not in those order confirmations. Um, um, the simple method of cancellation, um, there's a little bit more detail in those uh, on, on that front too in the state laws. Um, we're seeing more state laws requiring now notices of renewal, especially when the initial subscription program is longer than a month, um, usually hitting at six months or a year. So those are coming into play with sometimes with different timing requirements. Um, and then what happens if you're changing a material term? So uh, we're actually a lot of what we're gonna cover today is really focused on um, what the states are requiring because they fold in nicely into 
Roscoe. And I think one thing that we talk about a lot is this idea that there are very specific requirements. There's bullet points that you have to tick, but there's also this more general requirement that your offer can't be misleading or deceptive to reasonable consumers. So we look at these two things interchangeably. First, whether or not you're meeting all the technical requirements, but also whether or not the offer as a whole is misleading to consumers, that they understand what's happening, they understand they're going to be automatically renewed, how much they're going to pay, when they're paying it, what they're going to get, can they easily cancel, how do they cancel. So these issues really come in, and they are intertwined, but one thing that we do see a lot of is that the enforcement occurs on both sides. Whatever is most favorable to the FTC or plaintiffs or regulators will be, we'll say it's, we'll say it's not, you know, reasonable consumers are misled, or we'll say that you haven't ticked the requisite technical boxes. So it's really important to keep an eye on both of those things when you're looking at these offers. That's right. Okay, so um, we're gonna move into the nuts and bolts a little bit here. So the um, starting with the compliance requirements, we'll, we'll move to, I don't know if it's not working. <laughs> oh, oh, there you go. Okay, we'll move to um, the, the disclosures first. So again, what to disclose. And um, and many of you uh, work with us and, and you'll hear us go through this many times over, but um, you know, the key things are, you know, just telling somebody that this is um, a, a program that is going to renew, it's going, it's going to continue, you're going to charge them again and again on a very certain frequency of a certain amount, um, unless and until they cancel. So, um, and then, you know, letting them know the deadline by which to cancel, that becomes important. We've, we've dealt with cases where, um, you know, a disclosure looks good. It says cancel anytime and you won't be charged again. But um, if you've got a policy, for example, that says you have to cancel two or three days before the charging date or the next shipping date and you don't make that known and people are kind of getting stuck in that in-between period, those have become the subject of cases. So um, the details are getting more and more important. But again, the, on the material disclosures, things that you would think, think about, I mean, think about yourself as a consumer, what you need to know, um, again, how much somebody's going to be paid when, um, if they're required to um, stay in the program for a certain minimum amount of time, for example, um, a, you know, six months or 12 months of payments, you've got to let them know that too. So um, disclosing it, um, we have said um, clearly and conspicuously, um, um, again, before obtaining somebody's billing information, that's really their credit card information. Uh, we've actually had debates with regulators about whether the, a disclosure, for example, has to be above the, the credit card collection fields or whether it can be below those fields, but above a submit button. Right, like when do you obtain the, yes. the consumers? Is it when they complete the, the form or was when they click complete purchase? That's right. So, um, so the and again, I, it's um, without any sort of really um, clear piece of law on that, you could, you could see, yourself facing arguments on either side of that. Um, and then we see some nuances. For example, we just highlight the Vermont law here, but if, if there's a subscription program you have out there with a, an initial term of one year or more, Vermont wants your disclosures in bold. So this begs the question of, okay, should I just put all of my disclosures in bold everywhere? Or should I just try to figure out um, if people are in Vermont and on, only bold it for them? So again, we're starting to see these, these nuances pop up a little bit. Um, okay, let's keep going. Um, Next one. Let's leave it down today. Yeah, we'll do there that. we go. Okay, um, and then again, this is how to how to disclose. Um, it's got to be unavoidably noticeable. So, if the state laws will actually say things like um, larger type than the surrounding text, or um, um, contrasting type or font, or put a box around it, set it off from something else. Um, if you're on the phone, or if it's otherwise an audio disclosure. Um, you can't have somebody using like auctioneer voice that uh, nobody can discern and, and understand. So um, anyway, so clear and conspicuous, again, um, we're, we're commenting on that a lot. I mean, we see disclosures that we think probably look too small, but um, this is another one of those squishy areas that is more of a sort of a net impression type thing that we'll do, so. That's right, and we'll go through a couple of examples here. We're getting questions about whether or not um, these laws are B2B or B2C. Um, so the FTC, we've argued with the FTC about this one too, but the FTC has entered into contracts with, um, or has entered settlements where they're B2B, so where the, um, the defendant or the settling party is entering a contract with business entities or people who are you know, small businesses. We've also seen the same thing in California. The California regulators, um, I think they did Dropbox Pro and they did another, there, there was another lawsuit there too. So we haven't seen that issue litigated 
yet. So we don't know, we don't have a, we don't have a stance on that by a court, but we do know what the regulators are saying. Mm-hmm. And we would welcome that chance to litigate. Some yes, of I know. Some of the state um, laws actually do specify that they, they apply to consumer transactions. Um, but the FTC, I think, um, especially in light of having lost some of their enforcement authority under the AMG case last year, is looking for ways to make ROSCA much broader um, and use it in a, in a lot of creative manners that Roscoe might not have been intended to originally apply to. So anyway, let's get back on track. Sure, go through sure. cases. So here are a couple of examples. We think that the examples really speak, speak loud and clear. Um, this is a case that was uh, litigated under the California Automatic Renewal Law. You can see the checkout page there. In that case, the plaintiff alleged that the disclosures do not meet the um, clear and conspicuous standard and that they weren't in close proximity for the request for consent. The text was smaller than other texts on the field, and it was buried with other disclosures. So what you can see here is that there's um, a disclosure there saying that by clicking the box, you acknowledge you've read and agree to be uh, bound by the terms above and the membership agreement. Then you've got the automatic renewal and cancellation terms there in the middle and bold, and then you have terms and conditions of the website and privacy policy all lumped in there together. And the, the plaintiff said, okay, no, that's not enough. That's not clear. That's not conspicuous. People can't see it. The court disagreed, said that the disclosures did provide sufficient notice of the renewal terms, a cancellation policy, all those required elements that Ellen was just talking about. One thing it looked at was the fact that this was set apart in its own paragraph, the fact that it's bolded, automatic renewal and cancellation. Um, we'll talk about this in a minute, but in, in this case, the court did hold that the confirmation email was insufficient. Um, so it, it did allow the plaintiff to continue pursuing its claim, and we'll show you that example when we get to that element. Another example here is the Washington Post case. It was also under the California law. Um, in that case, the, the plaintiff alleged the checkout page didn't disclose that the, um, the specific method of cancellation varied based upon the person's enrollment offer. Um, it, didn't, it didn't explain when somebody needed to cancel there was also an allegation there regarding affirmative consent and whether or not the company had gotten consent to, to enroll consumers. That case settled before there was any type of decision determinate, determining the plaintiff's allegations, whether or not they were sufficient. But you can see here what, what types of things the plaintiffs are going after. I mean, you've got, the, you've got automatic renewal language above the start your subscription button, and that was a multi-million dollar settlement. We'll give you those numbers a little bit later. Similarly, there was a case against the New York Times, again, under the California auto renewal law. And there were some disclosures there, and I think this is a little bit muddled, but you can see there's a pricing disclosure. And then there's also a disclosure directly above the, the call to action where somebody completes their purchase and enroll saying that your subscription will renew automatically, you will be charged in advance, you may cancel. And uh, the plaintiffs challenged this as well. One thing that they said was that it wasn't in visual proximity to the request for consent to the offer. Um, the payment the payment terms that you can see on the right hand pan, uh, pane of that window. Again, the court in this case, there was no decision on the plaintiff's allegations or the merits, but this did settle. I think this was also a multi-million dollar settlement, um, as you'll see later in the slide. Okay, um, moving on to the consent element. So affirmative getting consent is 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 uh, both important under both federal and state law. Um, it really needs to be the ex- explicit, express, affirmative action of the consumer um, saying that it is okay. They understand that they're going to be charged on a recurring basis. They agree to that. They understand the terms. Um, you can't have anything in here be ambiguous to any extent. So it, we really don't want to bury this, um, make it inconspicuous. It's something that you've thrown into some terms somewhere. Um, and the consumer doesn't see it, and they're just checking out to buy what they think might be just a one-time purchase. Um, So again, just um, very important that that this is an informed consent disclosure. Um, So what what is sort of the way to go here? Um, Regulators do tend to prefer a distinct method of consent, a checkbox, um, having somebody give a signature, which is not very practical. We don't see that a lot, but I suppose typing in initials or typing in a name would, would be a, a great way to, uh, to go. But again, we never see that. We, we, we more so see a checkbox being used. Um, and um, so, uh, hold on, let me skip the Vermont thing here. And, um, you know, but there are some cases where we see um, maybe not a checkbox, but some very clear language that is put above 
a submit button. And if you can make that submit button actually be the action itself, if it's saying something like, I agree, agree enroll me. Yes, enroll me, something like that. Um, that's an argument that you have that, look, we gave disclosures that were clear as day um, and then um, had this very clear submit button that accepted those disclosures, essentially. Um, again, there's some nuances here. Um, Vermont, again, is kind of rocking the boat a bit. Um, they've got a law that says when the initial term is one year or longer, um, and it's got a renewal term of 30 days or longer, you actually have to have a separate opt-in mechanism just for that automatic renewal component of the offer. Um, and we've seen um, very early when the Vermont law, it's only been around for a couple of years now, but very early um, plaintiff's attorneys send them a bunch of dem demand letters saying, we read this as requiring two check boxes. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a debate um, that could be had about what does, does Vermont really require that or, or um, you know, can the mechanism sort of be all in one? So um, maybe safer in Vermont to use two check boxes if you don't want to have an issue with it, but um, you can think about your arguments there. So, um, okay. Um, if your offer has a free trial component um, or an introductory period or something like that, there are sometimes some additional requirements that go with that in the States. Um, so a lot of the states want a really clear disclosure with free trials that this, you know, there is a free trial period that will end at some point in time. And when that ends, you're going to be charged again. Um, some states go further and now will require that you send some notice before that free trial period is ending before you're gonna charge again. Just notice, just reminding somebody that you're gonna charge them again. And then we've got at least one jurisdiction in DC that um, wants you to get consent again before the free trial is over um, to continue on and, and put the, the consumer in a, in a recurring billing program. And actually we had a, a car brand rule for physical products that also did a very similar thing requiring um, consent again um, after a free trial period in order to continue on with the recurring um, um, program. So. Yeah, and these are these are really interesting laws too because free these these free trial additional consent laws they're they're typically triggered by the duration of the trial. So we see a lot of clients coming to us saying, okay, I've got a fourteen day trial or I've got a sixty day trial. So different, really different um, different laws and rules will apply depending on the details of your offer itself. Mm -hmm. So it's important to look at these and cl and closely examine them when you're looking at your offer as well. Mm -hmm. So the Bed Bath & Beyond case, in, in this case, uh, we've got the checkout page here. The plaintiff challenged the membership program. This was a membership program where you would pay extra and you were enrolled in this um, digital program where you got, I believe, free shipping and a certain percentage off of every purchase. And the, the court, so what was specifically challenged here was this consent mechanism. You had a checkbox that said, I accept the terms and conditions of the program. And hyperlinked behind those terms and conditions were the automatic renewal disclosures, all the disclosure required under California law. And the plaintiff said, well, that's not enough. You have to present them clearly and conspicuously, and they need to be in close visual proximity to the request for consent. And the court agreed. The court said the terms need to be in visual proximity to the request for consent, the terms themselves, not just the access point or hyperlink to them. And because the required terms didn't apply here on the web page that uh, contained the request for consent, they said, the court said, no, it's not enough. And it noted, it acknowledged, I think the court did acknowledge here that it's very common to use hyperlinks to terms and conditions. And we see this all the time when people are getting agreement to their terms and conditions, things that often contain class action waivers or other provisions we put in there to uh, protect companies. And, that, and that's sort of interesting to see now how courts are interpreting the specific requirement when it comes into play with these specific auto renewal laws, as opposed to other, other cases regarding um, binding consumers to other provisions as well. Um, the plaintiff in that case failed to allege causation. So, so um, that, that was a, a win for Bed Bath & Beyond, but um, not for the rest of us on this issue. Uh, one thing I will note, a couple of years ago, we had one of these presentations and we talked about Hall versus Time. And that was an example of a case where they actually did get consent well. So um, the court said the consent was okay. So we're seeing different courts, we're seeing different presentations of these web pages and, and how those are being enforced and interpreted by the courts. Okay, so this is a fun one, the plush care case. Um, yeah. 
so so in this case, there was a monthly membership after a 30 day free trial and somebody had to click through multiple pages to create a profile. It was um, for, I think, health health uh, provider appointments. You can use a service, you could book appointments. So you had to create a profile and then provide payment details. And then on the checkout page, there was a disclosure about a monthly membership, but it only appeared at the last minute, if you will. And there was a pop-up to the disclosure. Mm-hmm. And in that case, let's go to the next slide. Mm-hmm. The plaintiff alleged that this surprise disclosure about the free trial uh, wasn't sufficient. That's not clear and conspicuous because people were checking out, they're putting all their information. There's this idea too, we see this regulators and courts of the idea of uh, disclosure fatigue. People, by the time somebody gets to the end of a um, of the checkout process, particularly if the funnel is multiple pages, people get tired. Their attention is not as high as it might be elsewhere on the flow. And so the idea of making sure that you're presenting the disclosures in the right place or at times where people's attention will be heightened. Although I would say, Alan, I don't know what your thoughts are on this. I mean, it is right before somebody submits payment. Mm-hmm. So you have this, so, so now you're seeing this, this real, you have to balance this act of, providing these disclosures where someone's going to see them, making them unavoidable, but also making them at the, at, in close proximity to the request for consent to the offer. So, so there's a lot of, of different elements. And I think this is a good, um, a good case for that reason. As you can see here, the court said that the terms are not in visual proximity to the request for consent. And this really just goes to show you that I think the devil's in the details mm-hmm. and you can't, you can't just take another company's automatic renewal flow and say, okay, well, I know this is how I'm going to do mine and just copy and paste mm-hmm. it or something like that. You really have to examine your offer very closely when you're, when you're making these. Yeah. And one quick thing on this, I mean, I would agree that I would, if I were arguing this, I guess you'd go with the argument that, look, we put some disclosures right there and it's above the, the credit card field and, and who wouldn't get it. But this goes back to that entire sort of the whole net impression of the enrollment. And um, the screens we had earlier was like a big long, it was chunked out, but that would have been a big long scrolling um, enrollment flow, or really it was an appointment booking flow, I should say, to book an appointment. And and then they, this surprise <laughs> membership offer that seems to be added into the cart. And then you could see at the very bottom, book it says book, book appointment, appointment instead of like, like enroll me. Yes, very... book appointment and enroll me in the monthly program or something like that, that might have helped a lot more. So again, um, it's the whole impression of this these days is what you really need to think about on, on top of getting the, the technical requirements right. Um, okay, order confirmations are up next. So these are now really required in many states, including big ones. Um, but a best practice everywhere. It certainly shows up in, in FTC settlement orders under ROSCA um, and other places. So um, um, we do recommend this. It should always go out. Um, it's got to be not just a, uh, hey, thanks for your order. You're all signed up. It's got to be um, a really concise but comprehensive recap of the offer terms, everything they agree to that they'll get for how much they'll pay and when they're going to be charged and what card will be charged, um, things like that, or what payment met- method will be charged. Um, the cancellation policy is incredibly important now. Again, this is where we're seeing the cases coming through. Um, it's got, there's got to be um, not just a statement here that you can cancel, but actually some help on how to cancel. Mm-hmm. Call us, um, click here uh, to cancel online. We'll talk about California's cancellation requirement in a second, which which must be online if it's enrolled online. But um, that's all really going to be here. And then, of course, one of those unique things on free trials, um, making sure people understand that they can cancel before they begin paying and telling them how to do that. So. And one of the things we see, too, uh, that you mentioned earlier was that idea that if somebody has to cancel before a certain time um, to avoid that next shipment or that next charge, that's something that courts are saying needs to be in this in this order acknowledgement as well, mm-hmm. so that people know you're really hitting people over the head with these disclosures. Mm-hmm. That's right. So we're back to the... Um, the Weight Watchers case. Um, this is a snippet of the uh, confirmation email that was sent to people after they had completed their purchase and enrolled. And what the plan alleged here was that this uh, confirmation email did not clearly and conspicuously disclose the cancellation policy. Instead, it merely said instructions on how to cancel are located in the help section of the site. So it didn't say you cancel by visiting your account. It didn't say like it didn't go through all those elements. 
And I think part of the issue on this one, I had to double check this screenshot actually when I was doing this, the help section isn't, it's not hyperlinked. So I think that was part of the issue there. There was no clear means if you went to that help page. So if you navigated away, went to the help page, it, there was no summary or clear means of, means of accessing the cancellation policy there. You still had to dig around on the website to figure out uh, how to cancel. So the court said, okay, that's enough to say, say a violation of the California law. They let those claims proceed. Mm -hmm. um, I'll pause the, um, the CLE code is automatic 2022. Automatic 2022. Space or no space? I don't think there's a space. Okay, we don't know. Um, okay, so now we're on to the cancellation mechanism, which we've we've already hinted at. But again, um, ROSCA is um, a simple cancellation mechanism. It really translates to being simple, cost effective. So you can't obviously charge somebody to, to get out of something. Um, um, easy to find, easy to use. Um, a, a telephone number used to be good enough. Um, it's becoming more problematic though, because now you're getting somebody on the phone with somebody else and there's all sorts of upsells and downsells and, hey, can I convince you to stay longer? And it gets confusing um, on the phone because sometimes there's things like, hey, why don't, do you have too much product? Why don't we just pause your, your shipping for a month or two and then we'll, we'll resume it and people don't understand that that means they're gonna see it again and get charged again. So all sorts of issues there. Um, so just being really clear and careful with what you're doing there. But the big one is that um, when a uh, consumer has accepted the automatic renewal offer online, they have to be able to go online to cancel. Um, and that's been the requirement in California for a while now. Um, other states have followed that model. It's become good business practice um, and um, probably the, the, the best thing to do to, to kind of have a a consistent standard across all your places. And that's what the FTC in a couple of the cases we've resolved has said, is that if you're going to uh, let somebody enroll online, they need to be able to cancel at least as easily as they were able to enroll. So making it super simple, don't make it confusing, don't hide the ball. Somebody who wants to stop being charged, mm -hmm. stop charging them. And that's right. And remember the FTC can't further specify this type of rule. Online enrollments must cancel online, but they'll do it through their orders and, and sort of make it their standard that way. So, um, okay, moving on to the, um, the next slide. So as we mentioned, California's got a couple of changes that will become effective in July this year. Um, one is to the cancellation mechanism. And this is a big, big one. This is specifically for that reason I said um, on the phone where people call in and cancel and they're dealing with upsells and downsells. Well, it was also happening online. So even though, um, uh, merchants were um, providing that online cancellation mechanism. Um, it got difficult to find. It's buried deep in a help page or buried deep in an account um, page somewhere. And then on top of that, in a lot of cases, um, all sorts of screens that you have to read through. Like, hey, you sure you want this on instead? We could change the price. We can give you something different. All those types of things. So, um, so that the the new standard is really. Um, to provide a prominent, you know, link somewhere that goes really straight to the cancellation page. Um, it's got to be accessible. You can also um, you can also do something through a termination email that is formatted and provided by the business. It's a tough one. I'm sure I'm still like not sure <laughs> yeah, I've seen an example of this. I gloss over this one every but because I don't understand, you know, anyway, but most people are doing the link, but um, if anybody's got an example of the email formatted and provided by the business that somebody can use, you know, yeah, that's the I have to think that's one of the examples where we're going to start seeing the reasonable consumer stand uh, come out. I mean, mm -hmm. if somebody says, please cancel me and you don't, you know, you're not canceled, then th that's pretty clear. I mean, I think that's one of the issues. I mean, the overarching issues we always talk about here is that the real risk come in, comes in for these programs where you're charging somebody for something they don't want. Mm -hmm. You're continuing to charge them. They can't get out of it. They didn't know they were being charged. And then on the back end, if somebody's dissatisfied and they complain, re refunding them. Mm -hmm. Because that's really, the, we always talk about this, that the real risks lie within consumer complaints. People mm -hmm. are complaining. They didn't know they were being charged. They didn't get their money back. And that's when they go to the BBB. That's when they submit a complaint mm -hmm. to the FTC or a state AG. So, so even though this is sort of like a technical requirement, you can really fold it into more 
a broader requirement about treating your consumers fairly and avoiding risk from a practical mm -hmm. standpoint. I'm really curious about to see how this, this very last bullet plays out. So um, what California said is it's okay to require somebody to enter account information and login information to get to their account page and cancel. Um, but if a consumer is unwilling or unable to enter their information, you have to give them some other way to um, 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 authenticate their identity essentially, or, or, or use another method, I guess. I guess at that point you can let them pick up the phone, but you know, how many of us like have, have forgotten that bizarre, you know, 14 character oh, password yeah. oh, that yeah. we used to sign up with. And so is this going to be an issue there for people who then can't get online to cancel They're they're unable to enter account information. They can't get on the phone. So anyway, just some things practically to think about there if you're kind of going with an, an account login. Yeah, that idea that you have to allow them to cancel immediately without mm -hmm. further action really raises the question of what what will suffice for that. And one case we saw actually a while ago, I'll talk about the My Life case, but we saw um, the Match.com case a while ago. And that was one I think that it's still being litigated, the FTC down in Texas. And um, in that case, they, they offered an online only cancellation mechanism. You just had to navigate through, I don't know, five or so screens to get there. And the FTC said no. That's too burdensome. People, that's not simple. You keep asking somebody, are you sure? And then somebody might not understand that they haven't been canceled. So keeping in mind that just because you have an online cancellation mechanism doesn't necessarily mean it automatically ticks that box. You need to make sure that it still is simple just because it's online. Mm -hmm. um, so the My Life case. This was a case that the FTC brought a few uh, different claims under. But what was interesting here was that this, I believe, is the first time where we have a court granting summary judgment to the FTC, finding as a matter of law that the company's cancellation mechanism violated ROSCA because it wasn't sufficiently simple. It didn't provide a, a simple cancellation mechanism. So this is what the court said in its, its opinion. It said that my life primarily offered only one method of cancellation, telephone, which like we said, used to be enough, now not so much. Um, when consumers uh, sent an email request to cancel to the support address, they would receive an automated response saying, well, call us and we'll handle, we'll handle it. One of the issues there, though, was that people had a really hard time getting representative on the phone. So the whole times were very long. Um, the other issue was that they often got hung up on uh, when they were able to um, reach somebody. The other issue was that there was a retention or save script that, um, that the representatives had to go through after when somebody called in to cancel. And my life, according to the court, instructed its agents to inform customers who were seeking a refund, um, to inform them that they weren't refundable, and to always assume that the automatic renewal should continue on unless somebody expressly said, I want to cancel. So I think the court found a lot of issues there. One thing that was interesting in that case, though, is that there was a time, I think, after the California auto renewal um, law was amended in 2018 to require online cancellation. That company actually did offer online cancellation for California consumers. Nevertheless, the FTC still brought this challenge and the court still said this is, um, this is a violation as a matter of law. And this really goes to show you that you need to make sure that you're doing the right things by your customers. And when you do have a telephone cancellation mechanism, that you're looking at your scripts, make sure they're not onerous. Look at the hold times, look at your average hold times. If somebody has to wait on hold for 20 minutes to talk to somebody, the FTC is going to say that's too much. Um, and, and just being really careful with that. And the other thing I think too, is that I, I suspect that we're going to see a higher trend in a cancellation litigation by the FTC. I think that the FTC is going to start really coming after companies because I think that they believe it might be easier to challenge the simple cancellation mechanism than maybe some of the front end disclosures. So I, I think stay tuned to see what happens in the upcoming months with that one. Mm -hmm. um, here's another example of a settlement um, that the FTC entered Mm -hmm. So ABC Map, this, this has both sort of a cancellation example and a disclosure example. So um, in this one, you could see um, if you're looking at the big right under the 38% off, um, I guess there is one reference there to annual membership, um, but there's nothing explicit there to say that when you agree to pay today, you're going to agree to be automatically re-enrolled in that annual membership. And they use some other things that probably... Um, detract from the membership, annual membership stuff, such as the large $59.95 for 12 months with nothing more about that, or you could break it up into four payments, but it, it suggests that there are only four payments or Just one payment. Yeah, exactly. it's not a subscription. That's right. Um, and then the other um, problem that came up here, this is also a cancellation issue, 
Okay, so yes, it does say easy cancellation, um, but at this point, we don't know if that's referring to just a refund policy on payments you haven't made yet or the uh, sort of the recurring membership aspect to it. And they don't tell you here how to cancel. Um, and that became a problem um, with the complaints that were coming in as consumers had a really hard time finding a telephone number to use or an email address they could use or um, some way to log in. Um, again, we've got long wait times, um, some confusing processes here, um, allegations that cancellation requests weren't honored. Maybe they sent, were sent in by email and nobody picked them up. So just a few different issues going on here with this one. A couple of private suits. So the New York Times case, that was one of the issues in the New York Times. Um, the plaintiff in that case said that the chat facility was only available during office hours. So 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. That Those were the only times that somebody could uh, cancel if they went online and, and chatted with somebody, despite the New York Times representing that that was the cancellation mechanism. I mean, I, I don't know, 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. I mean, that seems like, you know, I don't, uh, I'm not a night owl, but like those seem like pretty reasonable hours. But anyways, um, so, and again, the court did not make a ruling on, on that case. So that court didn't decide 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. On, during the day is, is enough or it's not enough. But that's an allegation. That's a lawsuit that, that was brought by a plaintiff. Uh, an interesting one, too, is the J2 Global case. And in that, in that one, the court did make a decision and allow a claims to proceed under California's auto renewal law. Uh, for the failure to provide an easy or simple cancellation mechanism. And in that one, the plaintiff alleged that he had signed up, he was renewed, he was trying to cancel his renewal, he had 15 days to cancel to avoid being charged for the next year. He tried to call within that time frame twice and couldn't reach anybody. He was just on hold forever and he said, okay, I'm going to hang up now. He finally was able to get a hold of somebody outside of that window and they said, well, you know, tough luck, it's too late. And so he said, look, I, I tried to cancel. This just wasn't sufficiently, um, wasn't sufficiently simple. I couldn't cancel. And one of the factors that the court looked at here was that uh, the J2 global representatives were paid on a commission basis and they were incentivized to save the sale. Mm -hmm. They were paid more if somebody who called in to cancel decided to stay on the subscription. So they were really incentivized to, to be assertive and try to discourage people from canceling. And that's something we see a lot of with the FTC and California regulator state AGs. One thing we get, we get an investigation, we get a demand, and one thing they look at are call scripts, and then they ask, how are these people compensated? Are these people compensated to keep people, to keep consumers enrolled? Mm -hmm. So that's something you should look at too mm -hmm. um, when you're examining your auto renewal program because the, the regulators do scrutinize that pretty closely. And I would really suggest um, if you're in this space, periodic audits of what you're doing because we're often surprised when we're speaking with in-house counsel who are themselves surprised sometimes at what some of the business folks are doing. Um, and it's a lot of pieces that go together. It's the front end disclosures, it's the enrollment itself, it's the confirmations, but what's going on on the phones um, or what's going on during the online cancellation process um, become really important. So a self audit there or get um, a third party or get counsel to help you. Um, we listen to a lot of phone calls sometimes. Oh, yeah. We'll get, we'll, 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 we'll check on, I mean, a lot of you will have sort of quality assurance measures and things like that, but are you, do you understand sort of what you should be looking for in that or, or, you know, are your auditors like attuned to listen for some of these like upsells and downsells and, and other things that might be causing problems. So, yeah. And I think like the secret shopping, the idea of secret shopping is a great idea too, to just audit the process, go through your process, go through it with the eyes of somebody who's a reasonable consumer. And I think it's important to remember too, this idea that when we talk about the reasonable consumer, which is what the standard is, what do consumers who are reasonable understand about the disclosures? Are they able to cancel? They're not savvy, well-educated people necessarily. So looking at things with a, with a closer eye of how somebody who might not be in-house counselor, might not be a business person, mm -hmm. would look at something. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll keep trooping through. We are now on renewal <laughs> reminders. Um, it used to be three steps now. Like I know, it's now, what is it, six? I don't even know anymore. Yeah. Stop counting. Okay. So renewal reminders, um, we mentioned this earlier, this is becoming more of the norm, um, especially on the longer subscription uh, programs. It's in fact now a requirement um, in a lot of places. 
Um, by longer, we, we usually mean 12 months or more. This is because people forget. Um, it's a big pain and usually at the 12 month mark rather than the recurring monthly thing that, that you might catch on your bill and say, oh, I forgot to cancel that. And you're only out 10 bucks instead of the $200 mm -hmm. if you had waited all year. So, um, you know, there's there's some nuances here going on in the states that are start. They're actually starting to get quite annoying. Um, and this is where we're, we're, we're feeling like are these state automatic renewal laws going to become kind of like privacy laws soon? I mean, I think there's obviously sometimes greater ramifications to data security and privacy issues that haven't yet filtered, you know, come into here, but there's still enough differences now that it's making that, that baseline standard um, become increasingly difficult. So, um, you know, some, some weird, some strange things here, you know, North Dakota has got um, a notice requirement if it's a, a new renewal period of longer than six months and they actually ban um, automatic renewal periods that are longer than 12 months. So that's, that's a unique thing there. Um, California has got a newer standard now too that, um, you know, making sure people know that it's gonna renew, um, 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 get, telling them the length of re the renewal period in their notice. Um, and again, giving them the method of cancellation right in that renewal notice reminder, um, as, as well as contact information for the business. So putting these things in have become very important. Um, so when you're trying to construct a renewal reminder protocol or plan, um, you know, you do really need to think about um, dates become very important. So what is the date that somebody's enrolled? What, what date do they think it is? Um, what date is the renewal date? What have you told them? Um, you really have to be aligned. I mean, sometimes we've got um, historically pretty vague um, um, charging requirements. So we'll say like it'll, it'll renew in 12 months or, or on the monthly side in about every 30 days is what we've said because, you know, some months are 31 or whatever. So, so, but um, these dates can become really important. Um, I would say if, if the date could slip a day or two in either direction, just because of a misunderstanding of when things start or stop, having that really liberal refund policy that your customer service people know about to not give anybody a hard time if they're a day late um, would save a whole lot of headaches there potentially and kind of be the, the, the right consumer friendly thing to, to do. But again, all of these dates um, become important. They need to be on renewal um, notice reminders. Those reminders should really go out by email, um, some way that's capable of being retained by the consumer so they can go in and they can search for it and find it, use a name that they'll recognize. Um, we see a lot of things where I think consumers buy things and they can't remember, frankly, what name it is because the product name is different than the company. Oh, yeah, and the billing descriptor as right. right on the credit card. Yeah. Yep. So, and just our caveat there that now this one size fits all approach may not really work very well anymore. And, you know, to that point, I mean, we talk a lot about, G so I have a ton of clients. I always get clients saying, okay, can we just comply with California law? Because mm -hmm. that's the most litigated um, can we just try to just do whatever, you know, people you know, mm -hmm. do Colorado law in Colorado, Vermont for those, Vermont, Illinois. So we see that. So we have this idea of geogating or these questions about whether or not they can geogate um, their consumers. And I, I think it's difficult, right? Because on the one hand, these laws are so technical, the timing varies so much. And, and so I think, I don't know that you might have a five day window to comply with every state law that's out there right now. Mm -hmm. um, but on the other hand, you have to be careful that if you're geogating consumers, that you're doing it to comply with these state laws, not necessarily to, um, you know, to subvert them or to only comply with where you have to just do the bare minimum to uh, comply with, with the laws in each state. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. Uh, these are the new California requirements for notices. So California has now adopted that renewal uh, notice requirement. So if somebody accepted a free gift or free trial lasting more than 31 days um, that was included in the offer, um, then you need to provide a renewal notice at least three days um, before and at most 21 days before the expiration of that period. Um, then if you have the one year requirement, which is what, what where it really is, is sort of difficult, you need to provide that renewal notice at least 15 days and not more than 45 days. And that's that's aligned with a lot of state mm -hmm. laws. Um, the problem though comes in when we talk about the Colorado requirements, that it, it has another um, issue, another requirement. If you have initial term of 12 months or longer, that you need to send that renewal reminder at least 
25 days and no more than 40 days before the first auto renewal and every renewal after that. Mm -hmm. The new requirement that we're talking about more and more is that if you have an initial term of less than 12 months, you have a one month program, for example, every month the consumer gets charged. But they're on that they're on that subscription or they're on that program for 24 months, 36 months, 28 months, whatever that is. What the Colorado law now says that if there's an initial term of less than 12 months, you need to send a renewal notice at least once in the period between 25 and 40 days directly preceding the first auto renewal that would extend it beyond 12 months. Mm -hmm. So in other words, if you're going to be in a, if you're going to be on the auto renewal for more than 12 months, then you need to provide a uh, you need to be provided a renewal reminder, which is which becomes difficult just as a as a programmatic matter, keeping track of all your customers and knowing when they hit the one year mark. So now these business um, this this might be a bit disruptive to businesses, and I'm I'm wondering if I think we're anticipating that other states are going to follow the suit on this, that they are going to start requiring reminders not just for 12 month programs, but also for programs in which somebody stays on for over 12 months. Mm -hmm. All right. I have nothing to add there because I get mad at all. I know it is, it is a little ridiculous. <laughs> like it's just, it's really hard to, to comply with all of these. And I think, I mean, we talked about this. I mean, I sound like a, a beating a dead horse here, but as long as you're telling people, as long as they know, as long as they understand they're getting charged, um, you're complying with the idea behind these laws. I mean, obviously you're not complying with the technical requirements, but as a risk standpoint, if you're treating your customers right and making sure they understand when they're going to be charged, they know they're being charged, you're giving them their money back if they're complaining they didn't know, um, I think that you can materially reduce your risk, even if you're off by five days or, or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. oh. this way. Okay, so um, I think this is kind of the last um, chunk of, of requirements. Um, is when to give notice that, that you have changed the offer. Um, so material changes will require notice under California law and other state laws. So um, best practice to do it, I, I would probably say that the FTC would say it's an unfair deceptive practice not to, not to do it. So you could might as well count that there too. Mm -hmm. um, um, again, the notice has to go out in a manner that's capable of being retained by the consumer to us. That means an email or something searchable and storable. Um, you need to be able to um, tell them what the change is, what's a material change. I mean, certainly price changes are going to be material. Um, I think also significant changes to what they're receiving. Um, think about this maybe on like a box uh, program or a subscription program, if you're changing the components of what they're getting, especially if it's got maybe less value than what they signed right. up for, or even maybe more value when you're charging them more. That just might not fit people's budget. So. To me, that's a material change. Um, maybe who they're dealing with is a material change. If you sold the business um, and somebody else has taken over your program, that would be a material change. So, um, you know, right now, as I read the laws, and I tell me if you agree, but I don't. You don't need to consent to opt into these changes. But so under the auto renewal laws, they they typically just talk about notice and providing a method of cancellation. But I think under these general laws prohibiting unfair and deceptive acts and practices, a lot of plaintiffs are arguing, look, you can't unilaterally change a consumer contract. If you're going to change the contract, you need to give me notice and we need to have a meeting of the minds. We need to agree to it. Um, but to that end, one thing that we've started doing is looking at like, if it's an online offer, the website terms and conditions, providing provisions in there, giving you as a company flexibility to change your offer in consistently with these laws and ensuring that people agree to that, those terms and conditions so that you're, you're having in a contract that's enforceable and at least in theory, people understand how they're gonna get notices of material changes. And I think that's another way that you reduce your risk of these types of challenges, which I, I don't think are really viable under those, mm -hmm. those auto renewal laws. Mm -hmm. A couple of other notable state laws. Um, so Vermont, you need to provide a separate opt-in mechanism for the auto renewal terms, um, separate from the acceptance for the offer. So separate from the um, call to action to complete the purchase. And as plaintiffs are saying separate from the box you use to have somebody accept the, the terms and conditions, privacy files, whatever that is. If the initial term is one year longer, then the disclosures must appear in bold. DC has this notification requirement for the free trial period, so between 15 and 30 days before expiration of that trial period, and then obtaining additional consent before the end of the trial period. So you get their consent on the front end to, to go through that trial, 
and then getting consent to continue to be charged at the end of that trial where the renewal terms a month or more. Colorado, um, the cancellation mechanism requirements, it talks about those, um, what, what complies with that. So a one-click online cancellation li uh, link, an in-person mechanism for canceling at a physical location where the person regularly uses goods or services, which I think we had a question on a little bit earlier. North Dakota, as Ellen said, prohibits automatic renewal periods of more than 12 months. And one thing that we talk a lot about is the safe harbor, um, implementing procedures and policies that are written that you audit to comply with the applicable laws. California allows first, if you comply with the provisions in good faith, um, then if court finds out, it would, you would not be subject to civil penalties. We haven't seen that litigated yet. Again, this is another one of those areas. I'd love to see it litigated. I just haven't, haven't yet. Courts just haven't gotten there on these issues. We've tried to argue it with the California Automatic Renewal Task Force, but they, um, you know, they have different opinions sometimes about what is good, what is good faith compliance versus what is practical from a business standpoint and what we believe is defensible. All right, um, we'll move through this last section quickly, but you know, um, many cases settle, um, most cases really settle. And I think we're over a couple dozen now Roska settlements at the FTC, um, probably just as much in California and loads and loads of uh, class action lawsuits, but um, on the government cases, I mean, the settlements are always going to be a component of what injunctive relief um, is there, and then what's the what is the monetary relief? And you know, the monetary relief in settlements is usually some calculation of, of refunds owed to consumers who signed up for this that that the, that the government agency thinks you know didn't know what they were doing, so giving them all their money back. Um, um, the injunctive relief, as we said, we've talked a lot about what the FTC puts into its orders that go beyond what Ross requires. And, um, and lots of times we see that fencing in language, which encaptures all the stuff that wasn't actually directly alleged in the complaint, but things that they don't want you to do. So we deal with all of that. But, um, you know, Jean, I'm wondering, does anybody actually ever fight back or litigate um, on ROSC issues because it's, it's always a lot easier to settle. Yeah, so I think we've really seen two cases. I mean, companies often do fight back. I think it's very hard to win against the FTC in a lot of circumstances, and we don't see a lot of substantive rulings by courts on these issues. The two notable ones are really the direct TV case that came out a couple of years ago in my life that we talked about a little bit ago. So in the direct TV case, there were uh, allegations about the company's subscription program and the disclosures that were provided prior to somebody landing on the website um, in the banner ads. So the disclosures in the banner ads and the disclosures on the website itself. Um, both of the parties moved for summary judgment asking the court to find as a matter of law you know, in favor of DirecTV if you're the company and, um, and in favor of the FTC. And the court in that case held, they granted summary judgment to DirecTV on their disclosures on their banner ads. Notably, the court did not address the website disclosures. It's, it allowed the FTC to continue uh, pursuing claims that the website disclosures didn't comply with ROSCA, but it said as a matter of law, the banner disclosures and pre-website pages did, um, you know, it, it couldn't find a, a, a violation in that case. That case subsequently, I believe the FTC actually dropped it. Um, I don't know what happened behind the scenes there. Um, the My Life case, you had the cancellation issue and the court decided in favor, for the, in favor of the FTC as a matter of law. And when you think about that, that's pretty intense because at summary judgment, there's a very high standard that the FTC would have to meet to show a violation as a matter of law. And, um, and the court did find that. So those are two cases that, that we look at when we're really looking and saying, okay, this is what a court would find. Um, the other case that we should talk about here, I think is the AMG Capital case really briefly. Mm -hmm. Everyone's talking about the AMG Capital case. The FTC now can't pursue monetary relief under section 13B, under the, under the section 13B authority. As a result, while that's being worked out um, in Congress and, and behind the scenes, the FTC is now sort of scampering around looking for new ways to obtain monetary relief. And one that we're seeing, I think, a lot of is ROSCA. Mm -hmm. So they're, instead of just going after false advertising, advertising claims broadly, they'll say, okay, I've got this company that's offering products on a negative option subscription basis. I'm going to go after them for their ROSCA, we'll find some ROSCA violations. And then we'll go after them on these other violations that are just false advertising. Let's get money this way and we'll get injunctive relief through all of it. 
So that is really what we're seeing, I think, as a stopgap. In addition to the other, I mean, the FTC, obviously, section um, like 5 m notice penalty offenses. But but this is what I think we're going to we're going to continue seeing a lot of, at least over the next year. Mm -hmm. It's it's um, I think it's a it's a, almost a scary proposition because it's a um, Rasta can be applied in a lot of ways. I mean, almost every transaction right now is, um, and, you know, um, consummated online, I would say, even a, even a contract that is DocuSign. Um, so if you've got a contract with an automatic renewal provision and it's DocuSign, is that put it under ROSCA? Um, so things to be really careful about. I would I would argue all day that the Congress did not write ROSCA to encompass those types of contracts. It was really written for online shoppers. But um, again, the FTC is a little bit um, um, hamstrung right now on what they can do. So, um, okay. So we're gonna um, get through this. This is just a recap. We've already talked about the enforcement trends. Um, you pick it up by now, but the disclosures um, and cancellation, I think was where I would go there, but we should spend just a minute on, I think the dark patterns. Dark patterns, they're using this new word dark patterns. Mm -hmm. I'm not entirely sure what it means. I think it's just a repackaging of uh, this idea of unfair and deceptive acts. Um, so the FTC is just trying to sort of um, make everybody look worse by using the word dark patterns. But um, the FTC recently issued uh, an enforcement statement about dark patterns in, um, in a negative option enforcement statement. And it said that these disclosures are required. Um, any material term related to the underlying product or service, uh, the fact that consumers are going to continue to be purchased, the deadline by which you have to cancel to stop the charges, the amount, the date you'll be charged, and any information necessary to cancel the contract. I mean, that first one, the material terms related to the product or service, we saw a case last year against MoviePass where there were terms that the FTC alleged were not disclosed specifically with respect to the limitations on people's ability to use their movie passes, to access their movie passes and use their movie passes to get into specific movies. And the FTC, well, that violates Roska because that was a material term that you didn't disclose. So we're really seeing FTC, the FTC just try to shoehorn and throw, throw this the, everything at the wall and see what... Um, see what catches. And then here are the um, elements it believes are necessary to obtain consent, um, obtaining that acceptance of the, of the subscription negative option feature separately from any other portion of the transaction. Don't have information that muddles it or confuses people. Get um, um, unambiguous consent to both the negative option feature, that idea that you're going to continue being billed until you cancel, as well as the entire transaction and being able to verify that consent. So ensuring that it is verifiable with that consumer, with a specific consumer, with that transaction, with that date. I mean, keeping good records, I can't really, I can't hammer that in enough is that keeping records are important. Um, simple cancellation mechanisms. We've talked about this a lot. Cancellation mechanisms are at least as easy as the enrollment mechanism um, over the same website or web-based application. Don't divert somebody to like a different, um, that, that sounds sort of silly, but diverting people to a different platform that you use for cancellation, that is something that the FTC would frown upon. Um, telephone cancellation is becoming increasingly diff difficult to comply with the, the negative option requirements in the um, when you're offering telephone cancellation mechanisms. Don't impede the operation of the, can the promise cancellation policy. And one thing I will say is that I've seen um, issues where a company will put one cancellation policy online and then they won't honor that cancellation policy. You can cancel by emailing us, somebody emails, and then they're directed to call in. And, and this is what I think the FTC is saying that you really can't do. You, don't, you have to honor the cancellation policy. You can't hang up on people. You can't provide false um, information. You can't put them on hold with the hopes that they're going to hang up. Mm -hmm. um, all of these sort of delays. Mm -hmm. I think, should we just, uh, last slide yeah. on the next one? So yeah. we'll just, the last slide, we'll just put this up here so you can see sort of the, the um, what this amounts to in dollar figures um, on the, these cases. So here's a bunch of examples for you to look at. And, um, you know, the dollar figures are, are eye-catching, but I really do think injunctive relief and sometimes the parties, um, um, small companies often have officers, offers, officers and directors names. So those can sometimes be even more crushing aspects of these types of things. So um, anyway, the best thing is just to do your, do your best to comply, try to think about both the technical rules and the practical application of these things, sort of the net impression of the entire enrollment cycle. Um, and um, we'll try to keep you updated. So, Definitely. and we'll, we'll try to get to the questions. Sorry, we have too much content, I think, to get yeah, to Thank you everybody for joining us. I know we're at the top of the hour. And feel free to reach out to us with any questions um, and, and we'll respond to the questions after the presentation. Okay. Thank you.